Hello and welcome to another video from the Sustenance and Covering, the only channel you need to not only survive the current apocalypse, but actually enjoy it. And I'm Yusamos. We've been doing this interview series for a couple of months now. And today's video, we're going to be talking about the collapse. Yeah, um, well, you know, it's like, like it's, it seems like that's a big subject now. Everybody's worried about a collapse. And a lot of people associate the collapse that they see with their eyes with uh, prophecy from the Bible, the collapse as the Bible describes it. And so uh, we have to wonder if it, in fact we are living in the last days because a lot of people think we are. But in, in the Bible, we're constantly told about a period that's uh, the last days, but it's always spoken of as a 1,260 day event. Yeah. And the 1,260 days, that corresponds to a return to 30 day months as well. That's right. So, because it's, it calls it the three and a half years. It calls it the time and times and half a time. It calls it the 42 months and it calls it the 1,260 days. If we go back to the earliest parts of the Bible, when time is described uh, in any amount, it's always associated with a 12 month, 30 day month year. So, so that time cycle does not match the time cycle we have today, but we just have to understand that time worked differently back then than it does now, and in the future, time will go back to being as it was in the beginning. So 1,260 days, the, oh, the way that the churches get around this, because a lot of churches, well, all churches are based on fear, but a lot of them try to incorporate a fear of the last days into their adherence, and so they'll say that uh, those days are actually years. You know, I've been in religions before when they say that it's, uh, yeah, yeah, when, when uh, Moses was out there in the desert with the Israelites and they sinned for the 40 days that Moses was on top of Mount Sinai, they said, okay, for every day you're going to get a year in the desert, a day for a year, a day for a year. And so for 40 years, the Israelites wandered around the, the desert as uh, a punishment for the 40 days that they sinned. But there's nowhere in the Bible does it say that if you read a prophecy about days that's really about years yeah. so we've got this uh, belief in a lot of the religions that the 1260 days is not literal but the Bible says it over and over again that it is literal and you know if if we were to take take it that everybody who's talking about the last days is right then there's people that predicted the last days a thousand years ago there's people that predicted they were in the last days at the turn of the century well, that time period's run up. You know, at the end of that 1,260 days, something should have happened. Yeah. And it didn't. So we're no, no, we're not in the last days. We're we're in a period leading up to the last days. Right now, I think I need to to mention that I have a video called "A Young Earth and the End of the World." It's all about our place in the stream of time. And the reason this is so important is because at 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 4, it says that there's going to be people saying that, uh, you know, where is this promised return of Christ as if he's never coming back? And I don't want anybody thinking that I'm one of those people. Jesus said that no one knows the day or the hour. And for the most part, that's only because our solar system has been altered by God in such a way as to make accurate timekeeping impossible. But even though our solar system no longer marks the passing of time as it once did, we still have day and night and the passing of the seasons, which, which means that we can at least identify the general time period when the last days will begin. And currently, we are dead center into that time period. Have you noticed in your experiences with religion or the churches um, that they try to present scriptural evidence for us living in the last days? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, it is what it is. Reli religion is what it is. It's what they do. They're not just going to go up there and say, this is what it means to be a Christian. They're going to have to somehow attach themselves to the only book in the world that Christians recognize as being from God, and that's the Bible. But 
I have to explain something that I, I end up having to bring up pretty often is that there is no religion on earth that will simply conduct meetings every week using different parts of the Bible until they completely cover every single verse. They're only going to repeat the verses that support their doctrines. They're going to repeat them over and over again, and they are never going to bring up verses that seem to disprove their doctrines. And that's the case with the doctrine that we are living in the last days. And uh, the one that seems to come up in every religion that has this doctrine, it comes up over and over again, is Matthew chapter 24. So Jesus is telling his apostles about the future, and they go to him privately and they say, tell us, when will these things take place, and what will be a sign that you have returned? And so part of Jesus' answer, a very small part of his answer is that there would be uh, wars in one place after another, and rumors of war, and there would be... Uh, uh, kingdom against kingdom, nation against nation, there would be famines, and there would be earthquakes. Uh, does that sound familiar to you? Yeah, I've heard, I've, heard, I've heard that one over and over and over again, as, as proof that it is the last days. So. Yeah, you see, that's what I'm saying. That's what they do. And I can promise you that when you finally got around to reading the Bible, and you came to those verses you automatically process that information as if you were reading about how to identify that we were living in the last days. But, and the reason I know that is because that's how I process it. I've read the Bible many times, and for most of the times that I've read through those verses, every time I got there, I automatically just process the information as if I was reading proof text that we were actually living in the last days. But if you go back and you clear your mind of everything you ever heard in a church and you read those, those verses, the entire chapter 24 of Matthew, you're going to see that what actually happened is Jesus' disciples are being told about the future. They go to Jesus privately and they ask, what will be a sign that we're living in the last days? Uh, actually, what they said was, uh, what will be the sign of your parousia? Parousia meaning presence, the sign of your presence. And Jesus says, be careful. There's going to be a whole lot of false Christ and a whole lot of false prophets. You're going to have false Christ and false prophets everywhere telling you that, we're going to have, that the uh, sign of the last days is going to be wars, rumors of war, kingdom against kingdom, nation against nation, famines and earthquakes. But those times will be filled with false Christ and false prophets because false Christ and false prophets will be everywhere. So he's not telling them that these things, famines, warfare, and earthquakes are signs of the last days. What he's telling them is if somebody tells you about earthquakes and famines and wars, they're false prophets. So if false prophets are telling you that's a sign of the last days, and obviously earthquakes and warfare and famine are not signs of the last days. Um. Are you anticipating seeing anything significant happening before we enter into that cycle of 1260 days? Well, you know, one of the things that it says in the Bible is that God doesn't do a single thing until he, unless he first tells it to his people, the prophets. And, uh, you know, the, the prophets are anybody that's hip to what's going on, and a lot of people have got a feeling that we're headed for a period of uh, well, in, in the vernacular, it's the end of the world as we know it. Teotihuacan. Teotihuacan. I actually prefer Teotihuacan. Sounds like some ancient prophecy, but it's not, is it? Well, but te this Teotihuacan uh, actually has been happening for 6,000 years, you know, because the end of the world as we know it, well, honestly, the world as I knew it when I was eight years old is not the same world that I'm in now. You know, and pretty much everybody's experienced that. I don't care if, if you were a guy that lived, you know, in horse and buggy days, then when they introduced the car, you can believe that that was the end of the world as then people knew it. You know, and the same thing is uh, back in the day when feudalism was set up. You can believe that the people who did not live under feudalism's rules experienced an end of the world as they knew it when feudalism took over. So it's like every every single person has probably experienced an end of the world as they know it. But is that really an significant, you know? Is that a turning point in history? Um, probably not. 
But, that, but there are things that we have seen happen throughout history that are not the that obviously mean that we're headed for some kind of a, you know, conclusive end to the system we're living under. Because uh, in the fossil record, which I believe is real, 99% uh, of the things that live in that fossil record are not living species today. So, you know, you can believe what science says about how that's a natural process that's been going on for billions of years, but if you read the Bible, you'll see that most of those uh, creatures that are mentioned in the early books are not mentioned anymore. So this is all part of that process. You can't have 99% 90, of the species on this planet die and not come to the conclusion that the other 1% is teetering on the yeah. precipice of, of it, you know, going to the same world those fossils are in. So that's a big change. That's real. That's very real. That's that's current. That has happened in the past. It's currently still happening, and there doesn't seem to be any end to it. And it doesn't even be it seem to be slowing down. In fact, it's speeding up. It heightens, uh, quickens. There you go. And we here we are. You know, the the canopy of the forest. This is just my own opinion because there's nobody was, is alive today that was alive back then. But we know that in, in the course of our lives, the canopy of the forest has been greatly reduced. I mean, some forests are disappearing. It doesn't mean that, the, that those areas are completely devoid of trees, but the trees that are taken over are considerably smaller. The area where I live used to be a rainforest, and <clears throat> yet now the canopy is about 50 feet in my lawn, you know, the, the area that I own. Earthwide, there probably was a time when the canopy was at about 500 feet. And now, it, earthwide, if you take all of those areas where that existed back then and average them out, probably the canopy today is at about 10 feet. You know, if you can, if you if you average in all of the areas of the Earth, like the uh, the polar regions and the, the deserts and the mountains, you know, people who have gone up and studied these these areas have found fossils of huge trees. So, you know, it's not just that we look at our forests today as compared to our forest in the past. We have to look at the entire Earth's land mass as it exists today. So that there are changes. We're absolutely heading for an end, and we're awful, awful close. I mean, you can't, if you, you go from 500 feet of forest down to 10 feet of forest, and when I say canopy, I mean the height of the, the trees. Yeah. You, know, you average in the deserts, which is, is at zero inches, and you average in the rainforest, which are, may still be close to that, uh, you still end up with uh, an end of the world event. So, I mean, we spoke about, we've spoken about this before, uh, that we live in the center of the empire, the UK and the US empire, which is currently ruling the earth. Uh, the conditions that we're experiencing experiencing in our lifestyle and our, our way of life, it's vastly different from what the majority of the rest of the Earth is experiencing. Are you anticipating a time when the West will begin to experience similar conditions that, to that, those that we see, say, in the Middle East or in parts of Africa or Eastern Europe? Yeah, we're gonna, you know, we, if we're perceiving a change in our life, that doesn't mean that every single person is having the same experience. Some people have already been forced into the, this horrible, horrible living conditions where they're, they're running out of food and they don't have water, and we don't have that. But at, uh, that's localized. You know, we, where we are, we have that, but are we going to experience what they have? There's really no reason to believe that we won't. You know, I mean, if... if things are headed in that way. Here's, here's the reason that that might not happen. It's because we, we occupy the area of the Earth that dominates the other areas. Yeah. And so we're not going to be uh, uh, exposed to that. We're not going to be in a situation where another empire takes over and forces us into that. But our own empire, the empire that we live under, may perceive that it's necessary to start inflicting the same amount of brutality here that it inflicts on other parts of the world. I've always looked at, um, and, and I know it's a it's a contentious issue for lots of people just to talk about this, but I've always, but I've grown to look at uh, the situation in Israel and Gaza as being a bit of a microcosm 
of the way that the Empire treats the rest of the Earth. Something that sits on top and everything else is kettled in there. And there's a big wall built around it. And yeah, every aspect of life is controlled. Well, there's a lot of people that they call conspiracy theorists that have already got, they know exactly where the walls are going to go up. They know who's going in those walls and who's going to be outside of the walls. Um, and, um, you know, when I was a young person, a conspiracy theorist to me was the same as it is to anybody else. But as I've gotten older, I realize that they have a lot of good points. And I also realize that the conspiracy theorists that were around in the 1960s when I was a child were right. True that. We weren't right about everything because there's, there's always somebody out there that predicts that uh, the earth is going to invert and dinosaur aliens are going to eat everybody or something like that. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, most, most of the conspiracies are pretty reasonable. And they were pretty reasonable back then, but we didn't recognize them as reasonable because they didn't match our own perception of the world as it was presented to us. Yeah. You know, it takes thinking out of the box. Not too many people can do that. And if you're in the box, it's going to sound like foolishness. So, yeah, perceived collapse versus actual collapse. I mean, one of, my, one of the things I grew up with, and be, we're, I'm, a bit, I'm a little bit younger than you, but, the, you know, tail end of the Cold War, I, was, I learned about nuclear weapons and the, their horrifying effects of them quite early on. Wouldn't take much. Yeah, but our perception it never really does match the reality. You know, I mean, in World War II, nuclear weapons were actually delivered onto population areas. Yeah. And people died by, by the thousands. <clears throat> and and uh, the technology that existed then has been surpassed. So it's, it's a reality, but uh, growing up, I, I know that I was every day looking out the window to see if any airplanes were dropping anything suspicious onto, you know, my locale. It wasn't until after the Cold War was over that we found out that even though nuclear bombs exist and people had them other than just the, the politicians of the area I lived in, that there's a lot more to a nuclear bomb than just the explosive ability. You have to have a way to deliver it. And in the Soviet Union, even up until the time that the Cold War ended, never had a functioning delivery system for their weapons. You know, so right now we're told that every every country from uh, Saudi Arabia to Africa to China, uh, New England or whatever has we these nucle <laughs> nuclear weapons. <laughs> And, and the, the reality is, is like, yeah, I'm sure that these things have proliferated all over the place, but you, 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 if you don't have a way to get them anywhere, then it's not really as much of a threat as we might perceive. Okay. But, I mean, a lot of things that we, we perceive as a, as a threat are not real, not real at all. I mean, uh, what I hear a lot in the people I talk to is that China is a – about to attack us and they have a billion men and you know we don't have anywhere near that many but China is basically a third world nation that serves the empire under threat of destruction or imprisonment or whatever you know they, when you can go to a Walmart and buy a pair of shoes for ten dollars from China that's not our enemy that's not the people that are gonna come over here and shoot everybody they really don't have a way to get here you look at uh, the information that's found in Jane's Book of Warfare, where they talk about every ship of every country and every bomb of every country and every uh, weapon of every country. And if you really look at that reasonably, and even if you believe that every word in that is true, there's the, there is the empire and there's the rest of the world that can't do anything about it. Well, yeah, I guess that, that, that probably brings us around to ideas of global and local. At the moment, I know, and I know there's a lot going on in America, like the construction of America's FEMA agency, um, and they're looking at it as an indication that the collapse is imminent. And certainly in the UK, we're seeing a rise in like draconian, totalitarian swing to the far right. Um, what are your feelings on that? 
is that is that is that a sign that the collapse is imminent, or is that something else? Well, it may be a little bit of a an increase in the threat to those of us who are not in prisons. You know, I mean, anytime they if you've got ten prisons and suddenly you have eleven, that's that's worse. But it is a it, you know, and we first off we have to decide whether or not these FEMA plant camps are actually going to be used as prisons, or if they are, as the Empire says, just food distribution places or whatever. But let's just take it that all these well conspiracy theorists are right. They've got it right. All of these buildings that FEMA is putting up, all of these fences that they're building, and uh, all of the things that look awful lot like concentration camps really are concentration camps. What is the difference between a prison, you know, the reg a regular, everyday, ordinary American prison system and a FEMA camp? There probably isn't any. I'd say there might be one difference. What happens in a prison is certain legal things that have to be adhered to even if it's just lip service whereas in a, in a federal emergency situation that stuff goes out the window you actually have a pretty good point there um yeah it's yeah that would be significant because even though the laws get worse and worse and worse every day it's still the same system of laws uh if fema starts just locking up people by the thousands then that would be different but I mean, it, it, this is this is the way every empire works because all empires rise to power. They get so powerful that they can no longer sustain themselves, and then they fall. And they follow a, a pattern that seems to be the same in, in each and every empire. The law as the laws get worse and worse. Initially, the laws are things like don't kill and don't steal, and the people who to break those laws get punished and the citizens are happy with it because if you're going to subject yourself to some kind of oppressive government you want to feel like you're getting some kind of benefit out of it so, so you you don't want to just submit to oppression but you're willing to do that if the press the oppressor promises to protect you from from crime but as time goes on you you get other laws put in there that don't really affect you they they don't protect you they don't benefit you like Everybody who don't pay taxes goes to jail. People that don't have health insurance get fined. People that don't keep their grass a certain height get fined. Uh, people that grow the wrong kind of plants go to prison. People that purchase those plants or smoke those plants go to prison. You know, for the vast majority of us, there there is absolutely no no reason to put those people in jail. Now, the way it's presented is that people who smoke marijuana have a higher propensity for stealing and killing, you know, and initially we agreed to laws against stealing and killing, but if those people actually do have some kind of a propensity for committing these kinds of crimes, well, those crimes are on the books. If they steal, you put them in jail. If they kill, you put them in jail, but you can't really put people in jail for pre-crimes, And but we are supposed to believe that that's what's happening. Now, the actual reason that the prisons exist isn't to protect us, it's to protect the guys that make the laws. And, but, I mean, we're just presented with this fiction that the prison system is to protect us. But it, what, what happens is the, the millionaires and billionaires that rule the world, they, they want everybody working because the more people they get working, the more money they make. So they've got six mansions, they look around, they realize that all their friends have seven mansions, they get upset about this. And so somehow they got to get more people working. And that's what prison is. Prison is simply slave labor camps. The, you know, people don't just get locked in a box and released after their time is up. They, they get put in there. They get trained how to use some kind of machine to manufacture some kind of product. And the people that own the prisons get insanely wealthy. It's the biggest growth interest industry in uh, the United States right now. But um, that's and that's a large part of of why if you go on, if you go into a prison, most of the people that are in there are not thieves and murderers. They're they're going to be people who smoke marijuana or people who wrote bad checks. And the reason for that is uh, the only re the only thing they want in prison is people who don't have careers. So if you're a murderer and you have a career, chances are you're going to get out on a loophole. But if you're a guy that lives at a mom's house and smokes weed all day then you're going to jail 
because that's that's the whole point of prisons is to get more people working. Now, if these FEMA camps are actually prisons, and it, if they do in fact start uh, opening them up and using them and putting people in there for crimes that are even more ridiculous, it's only because those those guys that rule own the prison systems realize that they're not making enough money to get that seventh mansion like their friends. My gosh. But I'm just a conspiracy theorist. <laughs> I mean, you can look at what you're told and look at what you see with your eyes, and if they don't match, you know, that, that's not really, uh, that's not, a, you know, a theory. Yeah, yeah, it's happening right in front of your face. There's the thing about conspiracy theorists, or conspiracy theory is, and this is what I always say to people, a lot of the things, like for example, Washington DC, the Egyptian stuff, the Masonic stuff, it's there. It's a fact, it's a physical reality. But what there is a lot of argument and conjecture about is what that, why it's there and what that actually means. But the fact that those things are there, that, that's just real. It's concrete, it's right in front of your face. Hiding in plain sight, I believe, is the expression. Yeah, I think a, a lot of it is just that um, we wake up with this world that we perceive. And we know that if we perceive it as it's presented to us, then maybe nothing bad will happen to us. You know, we, we open the fridge, there's a case of beer, some eggs, some milk, and we want that to be there tomorrow. You know, when you start swirling these ideas around in your head, then it opens up the possibility that there will come a day when you open your fridge and it's empty, and in fact, the light doesn't even come on. Nobody wants to think about that. No. No. I find myself thinking about that more and more. I'm sustenance and covering, and I think about it a lot myself. Um, do, do you feel that we are heading for an economic collapse? Uh, that, yeah, that's, that's very possible because it, economics is a fiction. You know, it's basically whatever be people believe. If you can make people believe that uh, pieces of paper with uh, really mean people in the middle of it, numbers all around their head, is valuable, then that piece of paper is valuable. But if people become convinced that it isn't valuable, then it isn't valuable. You know, we talk about a national debt as if it's an actual thing you can pick up, put it in a box, shut the box, open the box, take it out and play with it every now and then, but it's it's a total fiction. There, You know, when the first founding fathers of whatever empire said, let's convince people that this gold is valuable or this paper is valuable or whatever, that was created from nothing. You can say it's based on the amount of gold in a in a hidden location, or it's based on uh, the gross national product. But in reality, how, how do you how do you even figure that? You print a bunch of money up, you get people to accept that it's money, and and that's as far as it has to go. Everyone agrees. Everyone agrees that it works. Everyone agrees that they're going to believe in it, and then it goes along until it can't go along anymore. I mean, we have in this country, we have Fort Knox, it's up in Kentucky, and you can drive up there and you can see it from the, from the road. There's fence all around it, and then there's another fence, and there's another fence, and there's this building that's basically a cube. It just sits out there. And we're all told that, that all of our money is based on the gold we have locked away in there. Well, what if they didn't have Fort Knox? And they said, well, we've got a secret location, and we're not going to show it to you. Or what if they told you that they had taken all the gold and hid it on the dark side of the moon? You know, it's basically the same thing. Now, we're told that in the very near future, China is going to call in their debt, our debt, because we owe China so much money. That's, that's physically impossible because when we created our fictional money, it was based on the fact that some other country had created fictional money, which was based on the fact that some other country had created fictional money. And, you know, you can, uh, if you can find some abandoned island somewhere, you can go there and take banana leaves and write numbers on it and make your own fictional money. You know, it's based on nothing. You know, the Chinese economy is the same thing. At one point, the Chinese had founding fathers. 
and they printed up coins. You can go to a coin shop and buy them. You know, they've been making coins for probably longer than anybody. But it's a fiction, and yeah, it doesn't take much to make fiction go away. Yeah. Just another fiction. You feel that we're running out of resources. Well, see now, that's the thing. Resources are real. And it, but, you know, re reality is that we have uh, what people think of as renewable resources and unrenewable resources. And so there are people that are concerned and they want to shift over to the use of renewable resources as opposed to unrenewable resources. And, but, but the reality is we've only got, from God, we've only got basically uh, one resource, and that's the, the things that he's given us as food. You know, food and water. So that would include leaves, fruit, and seeds. Those are renewable resources. Trees are not a renewable resource because they're not a resource. You know, metal is not a renewable resource because it's not a resource. Those are the trees are other living beings or other living things. You know, it's like squirrels and monkeys and birds and fish. Those are other living things. Those are not resources. You know, and 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 if you take it to the next level, human beings are not resources, and yet there are humans on this earth that own humans, and birds, and fish, and animals. Oh yeah. Why do you think when we have wars, uh, civilian deaths, it's called collateral damage? It can't even bring itself to say that they kill people. Collateral. Dehumanizing. Yeah, yeah, that's like it. Th those people. It was that was bad because we were going to use that to buy other things. We were going to use that as collateral, but our collateral's been damaged. So now we don't have as much stuff available to us because we don't have any people to trade for that stuff. Yeah, so uh, we could run out of resources. I mean, the things that we're using are not supposed to be used. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, you just like something like petroleum. Now, I've said before that that's, that's going to be a big major factor in the end of the world, but maybe not. You know, that's also a perceived uh, loss uh, or real loss because... Uh, in the old days, you could go to a poor person's house because poor people had to live in areas that had oil. And you could take a bucket and you could fill up a tank with, with oil and take it somewhere and make it into gas or whatever you wanted to do because oil was at ground level. But once people realized they could set it on fire and make heat with it, they started digging it out of the ground until it was down low enough that you had to actually put in pumping systems. And then those pumping systems ran out, so they had to go down deeper and deeper until they got about a mile deep. You know, what a technological marvel to make a pump that can get oil from a mile deep. Well, now we're getting oil from about 10 miles deep. And the reason we're getting it from there is because that's where it's at. If you dig a one-mile one deep oil well anywhere on this planet, you're going to run, it's going to be dry. There's not going to be anything in it because that's how low the levels have gotten. You can say that it's a renewable resource, but apparently it ain't being renewed as quick as we're taking it out. Otherwise, we would still be collected in, in buckets from poor people's property. Well, we, we, know, we know for a fact it's presented to us often that um, resources are running out um, and that eventually every, everything will run out. What's your feeling? Uh, do you think everything's going to run out before Christ's return? The answer to that question is yes and no. There's absolutely no way in the world that our planet can continue to produce the resources necessary for human society to continue on as it currently does. That doesn't mean that we're going to run out of resources. It simply means that we'll, there will come a point when the Earth is no longer capable of producing the resources necessary to maintain this way of life. Now, as we get deeper into the conversation, I'll discuss why that's the case, but just know this, it's all a setup. And here's some real world examples as to why that's, that's true. When I was in the Navy, I had a good friend that got out and became a truck driver. Years later, when I ran into him, he explained to me that the best money he ever made the entire time that he drove the truck was working for FEMA. And here's the example he gave. Florida had a hurricane, and as part of the relief efforts, he was hired to bring in ice. Now, the stupid thing about that is that most people are germaphobes. I've lived through quite a few hurricanes. Most people 
as soon as the lights go out, start throwing food away because they believe that if you don't have electricity in your refrigerator, everything goes bad. They don't care what the temperature is. They simply start throwing stuff away. Really, people do act like that. And they start eating canned food. So you don't need ice to maintain canned food. Bringing ice to these people serves no purpose other than to cool down their beverages. So that's just stupid. Bringing in ice wasted a lot of resources that didn't need to be wasted, but there's more details of this story to show you just how ridiculous our society works currently. The neighboring states of Florida, or Georgia and Alabama, which were, for the most part, unaffected by the hurricane. They didn't lose electricity. They had hundreds of ice houses that could have produced the ice to bring to Florida, but it was determined by the government that the ice had to come from Texas. Now, here's two facts that make this story sound fishy. Jeb Bush was governor of Florida. At the time, his brother was president, and his brother's mansion ranch was in Crawford, Texas. My friend says he went to Waco to pick the ice up to bring to Florida. Waco is just outside of Crawford, Texas. And if you think I'm making more of this than what's really there, wait until you hear the rest of the story. It was determined that the ice being brought from George Bush Jr.'s house to Jeb Bush, Jeb Bush's house, had to be safety inspected before it could be delivered. Now, I haven't got a clue as to how you would inspect ice to make sure it's safe, but the government decided that that had to be done. Now, there are plenty of states between Florida and Texas where ice inspection stations could have been set up. But my friend says that he had to go to Kennebunkport, Maine to get the ice inspected. Kenny Bunkport is the home of the father of Jeb Bush and George Bush Jr. This, this story is insane, and it's incredibly transparent what was going on here, even though my friend was somewhat unaware of it, the connections. He, he didn't make the connection between Crawford, Texas, and Florida. All he knew was that Kenny Bunkport was the home of the president, the first, the first president named Bush. <clears throat> so... Anyway, why, you know, there were there had to have been truckers that realized that they, this was all part of a scam. But they, none of them complained. None of them said anything. It wasn't in the press. But there's a reason for that. You see, these truckers were making good money. And what that meant is that when they got finished driving this ice around, they would go home, open the refrigerator, the light would come on, there would be a case of beer, a gallon of milk, and a dozen eggs. As long as they had that, they're not going to complain about the way the system works. Now, here's another story that's just as insane as that, and this is from a trucker as well. I went to tr church with a trucker who told me that he had been hired to go to Florida to pick up a load of oranges to deliver to California. That alone is insane. We've really only got two major citrus producers in this country, California and Florida. There would be no reason in the world to use up... Uh, incredible amounts of resources driving a load of oranges from one citrus state to another citrus state. Now something that all truckers know is if you're going to make a living you have to have a load waiting for you when you deliver a load. Otherwise you're going to go broke. You have to pay for the gas to come home so you need to have some reason to come home. You need a load. So they asked him to wait around they would give him a load. Well, what they did was they unloaded his truck and they dumped it on the conveyor belts and they had workers come along and peel the stickers off those oranges because the oranges were in boxes marked Florida oranges. They all had little stickers on them that said Florida oranges. And they took those off. And they replaced them with stickers that said California oranges, packed them in boxes that said California oranges, put them back in the man's truck, and had him deliver those oranges to Florida, right back where he had brought them from. Now, you think this doesn't make any sense, and there's no way in the world people would do something that was that unprofitable, but it is profitable. People that, here's the thing, fuel, petroleum, is the single most subsidized thing on the planet. And by default, food is the second most subsidized thing on the planet. In fact, if you consider that most food requires petroleum products to grow, petroleum products to deliver, 
then that makes food the single most uh, subsidized thing on the planet. People who grow food, people who sell food, people who deliver food can make money even if they lose money because the subsidies are so high that you can make just as much money losing money as most people make making money. It's the same in the UK. Sorry to put in there. It's the same in the UK but with the agricultural, agricultural industry, farming. We wouldn't have farming here in the UK if it wasn't for subsidies. It's just not economically viable. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Oh, yeah, I know. I know. It's, well, on the surface, it seems to, to make no sense. But I promise you that when uh, you combine the information that we just talked about with information recorded in the Bible about the Antichrist reign, uh, uh, very, very soon it's all going to make perfectly good sense. And I can promise you this that in the very, very near future, all of the people that are performing these pointless, perfunctory tasks in order to make uh, money are no longer going to be allowed to do that. So what are we going to do with all these people who uh, no longer have work when we run out of all of these pointless tasks? Well, what would be wrong with just sending them home and, and not decreasing their pay? I mean, I'm not talking about sending home some people and making other people keep working. Just uh, take all the people whose jobs are half scam, half busy work, and send them home and just make them work doing the part of their job that has meaning. There's not going to come a day, as long as civilization is trudging along, where we don't need people to transport things. So, you know, you take all these truckers that are transporting things that make sense, and you keep them doing that, you just send them home for the stuff that don't make any sense. And, you know, it's not, it's not like that would only work for truckers. And, and, you know, I'm not trying to give ideas to Satan so he'll know how to run things when he takes his throne in the flesh. You know, the San Antichrist has already got everything figured out what he's going to do. And I'm just guessing. But it wouldn't take much to, to change human society so that it could benefit everybody. You know, if you, if you make it uh, a law that everybody gets a sustainable wage, make it a law that nobody's allowed to work over 20 hours a week, then you send home all the people that do important stuff, like janitors, for most of the time. You bring them in for 20 hours a week, and then you take people that have absolutely uh, no purpose in life, like telemarketers, and you just eliminate that occupation altogether and let them be janitors. You know, that sounds oppressive, but it isn't. I, I think telemarketers would love to be able to make a sustainable wage doing janitorial work as opposed to making a sustainable wage by lying and cheating and stealing. Not a big deal. And it's not going to cost anybody anything. Because remember, we're talking about eliminating busy work. We're not talking about uh, eliminating productivity. This wouldn't change a thing. We'd still have the same amount of activity, or the same amount of beneficial activity. All we're eliminating is the bad activity. So no one's losing a penny if everybody continues to make a living wage. And even if it does cost more. You know, what are we, how, how are we going to support that? The same way we support our current economy, with the imagination. It's like the Hoover Dam. Like all those big post-World War II projects where like, everyone's just set to work, big in, big in big holes. Oh yeah, that's the way it works. That's the way that civilization has always worked. Um, you keep people separated, husbands separated from wives, parents from children. Uh, you keep them... It moving, just keep people busy so that they don't have time to think. Keep them from praying, keep them from loving, keep them from learning. You make sure that everything they do is designed to destroy resources and destroy the earth. And basically, that's the whole point. But right now, that's exactly how it works. And it's not going to work any other way until we begin that period that we talked about that the Bible calls the last days. Now I'm going to tell you one more story to go along with the previous two stories. And the reason this story is important is because it's not secondhand. The last two stories I was telling you a story that someone else told me. I'm going to tell you now about something I've seen with my own eyes. When I was in the Navy, the last ship that I was stationed on was a fuel tanker. And uh, our job as a fuel tanker was to refuel the fleet while it was underway. We didn't do this at a standstill because you... You, you want to be a moving target in a, on a combat vessel. So we would pull alongside of other ships, including aircraft carriers, 
And as we were going through the water, someone would shoot a line across, and then uh, they would take that line and pull a great big hose across. They hooked the hose up to the aircraft carrier, and our ship would pump fuel to the carrier. Primarily, what we would be sending over is a product called JP-5. It is a, uh, it's a petroleum-based uh, kerosene-type product that has a... It doesn't burn as... It's not as volatile as other fuels, so... It, not too many uh, airplanes or jets use this fuel, but the the military, the Navy does because you know you're you're gonna occasionally crash a jet onto an, an aircraft carrier, and you want it to be carrying the least flammable fuel for when that happens. And JP-5 just happens to be less volatile than than other standard jet fuels. So anyways, occasionally, while we were tied up alongside of the carriers, they would be conducting flight ops. And I've, I, was, I learned from one of the Airedales, that's the, what they call the people that work on the deck. I think it's like uh, aviation boatswain's mate or something like that. I'm not really sure of, of what the exact rate was. But this Airedale was telling me that when those planes were taken off, they had to uh, take off under real-world conditions. So when a plane takes off of a carrier, it takes off heavy. And heavy, heavy planes don't perform the same way that light planes do. So they had to be heavy to simulate uh, combat situations. So they would, they would load these planes up with a full load of fuel before they took off. Now, all they were training for was uh, carrier landings and carrier takeoffs. So they would take off with a full load of fuel, do a loop, and land. They wouldn't really do any flying around, anything like that. But another rule they had was that uh, when, a, when an airplane lands, anything lands on a carrier deck, first thing you do before you land is you dump your fuel because you don't want a whole lot of fuel in the plane in case something bad happens. So they would basically take off full, dump the fuel, and land take off full, dump the fuel, and land. So we would be pumping fuel. And in general, when we would refuel a carrier, it would be something like a million gallons. So we would pump a million gallons onto the carrier. They would pump it into the planes. The planes would take off, dump it into the ocean, and land. We would go get another million gallons of fuel, bring it out there, refuel the carrier, and repeat the whole thing over again. And this happened... This is uh, 24 hours a day. I, I don't know how many carriers we have now. I think at the time it was like nine. And always at least a third of those were out there doing this all day and all night. So we're destroying the ocean while destroying millions of tons of petroleum for nothing. Now how easy would that be to fix? Uh, underneath jets are these hooks. Can, or can, there are all kinds of connection points under there for any kind of weapon system that, that a jet can carry. They have connection points for external fuel tanks, for rockets, missiles, uh, bombs, and uh, you can design basically anything that you want to put underneath of a jet, you can put under there. They could have easily designed some kind of a tank to carry water. Just that simple. And when you press the release switch, the water dumps out, uh, and it would be. And it, this is not something that would be beyond an engine, engineer's capabilities. You know, you put a, a refill line on the on the saltwater tanks that doesn't match a fuel tank, so you're not accidentally putting fuel into a saltwater tank or accidentally pumping salt water into a into a fuel tank. This is a one dollar fix for a billion dollar problem. Well. Well, what current events uh, do you think suggest that we are approaching the last days, that 1260-day period? Well, obviously, things we've already talked about, you know, the uh, people seem to be waking up to the fact that this system can't work. They're all prepping, which is a, a new word that never even existed until recently, for people who are preparing for the, an end-of-the-world scenario or an end-of-life as we know it. Tiatawaki, S-H-T-F-W-R-O-L. But uh, also global militarization. And I'm not talking about wars and rumors of war. I'm not a false prophet. But in the past, we've had big events, military events, and we called them world wars. World War One, 
World War II, and yet what's going on today is much, much bigger. It's exponentially bigger. Uh, per capita, it's bigger, and yet no one is calling this World War anything. Well, actually, in some circles, it is being referred to as World War Three. in some circles. Well, there you go, and that, that in and of itself may be a pretty good indication that we're quickly approaching the last days. Because in general, when politicians send thousands of men to their death, they like to brag about it, you know? That's why they call wars World War. So they could brag that they were involved in sending men to their death. And, and here we are fighting a bigger war, and I don't even know what they call it. It's like something like Operation Love or Operation Freedom or something like that. But uh, another thing that could be considered a sign that we're quickly approaching the last days is the technological advances that have been made. You know, we had 5,900 years of fire in the wheel. You know, obviously, it wasn't the same fire in the same wheel. You know, the wheel got bigger, the fire got brighter, the fire got hotter, the wheel got smoother. Uh, but just in the last hundred years, we started to put satellites in orbit. We've got GoPros, we've got laptops, we've got all kinds of stuff that's weird. It's not the same as the stuff that was being developed for the first 90% of the planet's history. So that could be a sign that we're approaching the last days. Um, but there are there are other things to take into consideration. And one thing that that uh, is really shocking and may actually be an indication that we're approaching the last days is the excitement in on the internet and the networks about building another temple. In the Bible, the temple is always associated with satanic rituals. You know, the very first temple. If you go back and look at the Bible, of course, most of Christendom's churches think that building another temple is a, a wonderful thing. But we had a, a people that was wiped out 2,000 years ago. Either all of them were either killed or dis, dispersed. The language was lost. The religion was lost. Uh, in, to this day, we don't have a clue about what those people looked like. But... Around 100 years ago, somebody got the idea in their head to attempt to recreate the nation of Israel from scratch. And so they went into that area where the original nation of Israel resided. They rounded off all of the people that lived there, put them into concentration camps, and they moved in a bunch of volunteers. They sent out flyers telling people that if they were willing to move to Israel, they would be given free land and... A lot of people took them up on the offer. Now, there's, you know, here, here we go. The Native Americans who were displaced from their land were never made this offer. And yet they actually have photographs of the people that the land was taken from. They have the, the names, addresses, and phone numbers of all their great-grandparents. And there's not a rush to repatriate them to the land that was stolen from them. But here we go. Out in Israel, people lost 2,000 years ago, their language was lost, their religion was lost, we don't know what they look like, and yet we've created this artificial entity, this fiction, put it in place, created a language which is only barely related to the, uh, the original languages that would have been spoken by men like Abraham and Moses, we've given them mon a monetary system based on the ancient weights and measures of the people that lived in that part of the land. And now they're talking about building another temple. If you go back in the Bible, you'll see that the temple was always associated with satanic worship. And I know there's a lot of people that, that can't think, are going to have a hard time accepting that. But um, when David asked if he could build a temple, God said, no, I don't want this built by a man of war. I want it built by a man of peace. But no one ever thinks about what that means. David was commanded by God to never make peace with people who worshipped Satan or any of the other demons. That was a command from God. And so when Solomon moved in, he became a man of peace because he formed marriage alliances with every demonic nation that surrounded the nation of Israel. And when he had the temple built, he had it built by the king of Tyre, it calls him Hiramab, which means our royal father, and in the Bible, the king of Tyre is called Lucifer. Later, when the, after the temple was destroyed, the king of Persia 
rebuilt the temple. And the king of Persia himself is associated with Satan the devil. It says that the, the prince of the royal realm of Persia fought against Gabriel, and Gabriel could not get away until Michael the archangel came to his rescue. Now, this is not a man. When it talks about the uh, royal, the prince of the royal realm of Persia fighting Michael, we have to know that that had to be an extraordinarily powerful angel. Once again, Satan the devil. Later, when Jesus was on the scene, uh, the temple that was there had been built by Herod. Herod is associated with Satan in the Bible. So there's no reason to believe that when the Antichrist returns, when Satan in fleshly form returns, that he will want to have a temple. And the fact that people are talking about building a fourth temple on the exact same spot as the previous three temples is probably a pretty good indication that things are lining up for the last days when Satan, the Antichrist, will take his throne. Well, we've taken a, we've taken a big look at the, um, the system as it currently exists. And what would you say the motivating factor is? I mean, do you think it's greed, or do you think greed is just a small part of the bigger picture? Uh, it's, you know, here, the basic motivation may just be money, because, you know, the people that are driving oranges back and forth and uh, driving ice around, it, it doesn't seem like there could be any other motivation. But we, we really don't know. You know, we don't know what's going through the heads of these people. I do know this, that... Presidents, congressmen, religious leaders, economic leaders look just like us. I've seen I've seen presidents before. I've seen I've been in the same room with congressmen, and uh, they 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 just look like us. They they have their own you know defects. They all grow old. They get sick. They die, and uh, they probably get sad, get happy. Uh, but it's but we don't know. We know this, that the Bible repeatedly speaks of Satan as the ruler of the world. And for, for him to be a ruler, he has to be somehow controlling things behind the scenes. Now, these politicians are so messed up. I mean, people that are in charge of this world are running the world in such a ridiculous way that you have to know they're being motivated to do this by an outside force. And to do things the way they do... It has to be something beyond their control. I mean, they may wake up going, let's come up with a scheme to make money, but it's altogether possible that uh, the Bushes were all hanging out together and a hurricane hit and they said, these poor people, what are they going to do without ice? We need to get them some ice, but we got to make sure that the ice is safe. You know, we don't know. We don't know. But we do know that uh, things are being manipulated for a purpose. So, you know, what, what would that purpose be? Well, the Bible says that when Satan, the Antichrist, takes his throne, that people will be bowing down and worshiping him for saving the day. So what better way than to simply set up a system that is so dysfunctional that Satan could go in there and do anything he wanted and, and still improve on it? You know, if you think, oh, there's no way that this could be fixed, you know, what you think about it, almost everything is a fiction. So if, if the Antichrist takes his throne and he's ruling over the whole world, he can wave his hands and cancel all debts. He can, at the wave of his hand, he can make it illegal for the world to be ruled by subsidies, just make people do work. He could, uh, which means that, you know, people in Florida have to eat Florida oranges, people in in California, you have to eat California oranges. And there's a lot more in the Bible to indicate that this is the way it's going to be because it says that when Satan takes over, when, when the Antichrist reign begins, that men will be turning their weapons into tools for agriculture. You know, the, as the English Bibles say, they'll turn their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. So that, that indicates that people will be producing food locally. Uh, another thing it says that people will spend time with their families or build houses and have the occupancy. So a lot of people earthwide who cannot afford a home will somehow s suddenly have the ability to acquire a home. And what does that take? All it takes is for the Antichrist to wave his hands and say everybody gets uh, a living wage. And dumping fuel off of aircraft carriers, what would it take to fix that? You know, just tell... tell First off, you could tell them they don't have to practice anymore, or you tell them that when they're practicing that they have to have external tanks attached to their planes 
load it with salt water. You take off with full load of salt water, we get off the ship, drop your salt water and land. You don't have to waste any fuel. I mean, there's a, it just it seems to me that the system we live uh, under is made uh, is so bizarrely run that it has to be for a purpose, and that's basically the only purpose I can think of. Any advice to people? Um, hopefully, you know, I mean, it, here's the thing is this, Tiawaki is, has got other names. Uh, SHTF, which we say all the time, which stands for shit hits the fan, means that, yeah. Yeah, I know. It's, a, it's like, okay, if this is what everybody's saying, let's go and explain what it means. Because a lot of people go, SHTF, why should I be afraid of that? What is that? <clears throat> well, is that the don't hit the yeah, the propeller, the electrical, but, but the, no reason, yeah, there's no reason to make this more complicated than it is, it's some odds, but uh, SHTF happened when, when Adam and Eve were cast out of the Garden of Eden, so, uh, but it, it's our own perceived SHTF, is our life getting worse, you know, and is it going to get so worse that we suddenly decide we have to take action, and there's another word, it's called W-R-O-L, that's world without rule of law well the, the thing about it is that in the bible satan the ruler of our civilization is called the man of lawlessness because even though we have a rule of law now that rule of law is based on breaking natural law yeah. so it's we're already living in a world without rule of law the world without rule of law that we're moving into is simply a world of different laws than we have now. Yeah. You know, so, you know, instead of putting people in prison for possessing the wrong kind of a plant, maybe we'll just start putting people in prison for wearing the wrong color t-shirt. You know, all of these rules are arbitrary. There's no reason in the world to assign any kind of reasonable significance to them. Uh, it's, it's all a fiction. So, Here's the thing, this WROL, the SHTF, the Tiatawaki, every one of those is being touted by people who have a solution. Whether they're going to be part of some kind of patriotic movement or they're going to vote in some kind of new representatives that won't lead us down this road. The reality is it's coming. It's not going to be a man-made thing. It's going to come exactly on schedule. There's not a way to make it come a second earlier or a second later. With that knowledge, all I can say is that it, we have no reason to even involve ourselves in it. Take care of your life. Love your children. Love your, your family. Love everyone around you. Love your God. Talk to your God regularly. And let those who want to participate in Armageddon go at it full gallop. I think there's, yeah, there's, one, thing, I think there's one thing you're leaving out, and this is the thing that you're doing right now which is you are sharing the truth with other people. Yeah, and you know, a lot of people are doing that without even me mentioning it, but it doesn't hurt to mention that. If this is something that you believe in, if you've watched other sustenance and covering videos, which there's quite a few of them out there, then you know that the information that's on that channel is unlike anything that has been shared with mankind for thousands of years. The privilege of sharing that information with others is incredible that's why i do it it's the most wonderful thing that's ever happened to me and if you involve yourself in it it'll be the most wonderful thing that's ever happened to you until this system comes to its conclusion can i ask one more question you... well it's one and it's something and it's just like it would lead on to something else what do you think is going to be the first event at the beginning of the 1260 days what are we looking for well, the very first thing that's going to happen is we're going to go back into a 360-day year. And people think that that would be hard to detect. But I did a series a while back called Written in Stone that explains everything that the Bible has to say about the relationship between the sun and the earth and the moon. Back in the ancient past, the Bible says that the earth and the sun and the moon were in a state called conjunction, meaning that the earth would experience a 360-day year. And it also says in the book of Revelation that we would return to that. So if you look at it mathematically, that would require that the sun and the earth and the moon come into perfect alignment 
with one another every 180 days. So the, there would be a perfect lunar eclipse every 180 days on the vernal equinoxes. One would take place directly over the center of the Earth's landmass, which back in the day would have been over Israel. And the other would take place directly over the Pacific Ocean. And even though the Israelites could not have possibly been aware of the uh, eclipse taking place over the Pacific Ocean, it's mentioned in the Bible. I highly recommend you go back and watch the Written in Stone series. But uh, the, the first day of the, the Earth going back into the state of conjunction will cause one of those lunar eclipses. It may not be readily apparent at first, but I believe it probably will. It'll probably be an eclipse that no one's expecting. But you can know this, that six months later, when we have another lunar eclipse, that something special is happening because uh, right now that never happens. You never have two perfect lunar eclipses 180 days apart. And in fact, for that entire 180 days, the moon will be in the nighttime sky. We never have that either. The moon has a regular cycle, which brings it into the daytime sky and the nighttime sky every month. Uh, along with that, when this first lunar eclipse takes place, the Antichrist will ascend to his throne. In the Bible, it talks a lot about the Antichrist being able to fix the solar system, and that's, that's going to be in an upcoming video. So th those are the two things that are going to happen on the very first day of the 1,260-day cycle, which means that that cycle will happen three and one-half times before the dead are resurrected, Christ returns, and the earth is restored. So do, do you, we've covered quite a lot there. Do, do you think that's, I think that's enough? This is a good place to wrap up? Good a time as any. Okay. Well, then. If you don't want to survive, don't listen to us. <laughs>